Hey guys, I am here with some really good friends, Kristen and Scott. And Kristen does an amazing travel blog called Camels and Chocolate. And you have to go check it out. Camelsandchocolate.com, right? Exactly. Nailed it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'm not used to doing those introductions. But um, today, you guys want to talk about making your photos go from good to epic, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, I don't waste any time. We just kind of get into it. What was that? Next level stuff is what we're looking for. Totally, yeah. Cameras for over 20 years and kind of feel like we've levelized, you know? Yeah, and totally. other things to learn that can take it up to the advanced. I just did a basic photography podcast today and I'm hoping to include this kind of stuff in the future. Awesome. So I see you're using a Canon 60, mm -hmm. which is, uh, from what I read, very familiar, uh, very similar to the Canon... Um, the Mark III, it's very similar in ISO settings and everything else. So I am a little bit familiar with what it can do, which is which helps. But you said, uh, what would you change about uh, some of these photos? You just guys, you want to get into that right away? Yeah. Cool. Okay, I've never shared a screen before, so we're going to try this out. <laughs> and okay, share this screen. So can you see my desktop right now? Yes. Okay, cool. And you see the picture of Kristen? Yep. Okay. So, okay, cool. So this is your picture the way it was. And this is what I did to it, like a quick little edit. Do you see the difference in that? Yep. Okay, so one of the questions that you guys had was um, how to bring out the whites. And like, what would, I, what would you do to this picture to make it more epic? Um, you know, honestly, like the picture is nice the way it is. I think I would do like a little bit more of a dramatic angle maybe or something. Um, the main thing when it comes to pictures like this is you want to eliminate the background as much as possible. So Scott, uh, one very easy way to do this is to get a, a longer lens and then get further away from her and get this same kind of composition just further away and that'll blur your background more. Mm -hmm. um, that's the number one thing that I would do. Uh, and I would watch out for little things like just cropping off the edge over here just a little bit. Um, that's just a personal thing to me. But um, Well, that was why I, I picked this image, Joe. It's, I, I picked it because I, it was, I feel like it was a good subject, both Kristen and the car. Yeah. When I, like figure out how to make it interesting um and you know this like the car's cropped and um so yeah not just um the editing post but also the framing in the beginning is what i you know like that's the type of thing that i feel like is an evolution of a photographer is you're always looking at the, the framing of it too and um and some of that could be gear like i mean a longer lens we've been talking about getting one but there's so many options too you know, because I, I also want to be able to shoot that hummingbird. If I, if I spend $2,500 on a lens, I want to be able to shoot the hummingbird across the street, mm -hmm. but also maybe use it in a situation like this and break it out and mm -hmm. get better framing. So, Well, and you guys are also concerned about carrying gear. All the time. You, want, you don't want to have to carry a whole bunch of gear, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, we are kind of in the market for a longer lens because there's, I feel like, We've been using that 24 to 105 for a decade now, and it's still a great lens, especially for versatility. But I think we're to the point where we need a longer lens in our portfolio. And so I don't know if you have a recommendation for a good one that is still versatile in terms of like, because we're traveling and we're adapting to a lot of different situations. It's not like we're shooting at home in a studio, so we need something that can adapt with us. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I think the main thing that I would do if I was shooting travel and I wanted to carry as light a gear as possible is I would, um, I know you do like interiors of like mm -hmm. hotel rooms and stuff like that. Um, for something like that, I'd get a 24 and, uh, because a 24 is really small and maybe get a 35 also. That's really small. And then your next lens can be a bigger zoom that goes from like 70 to 200 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, the way I used to shoot was 14 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, because I felt like I had to get every single zoom length covered. 
But now mm -hmm. I shoot uh, 35 and 7,200. I still have my 14 to 24, but I don't use it much. Um, all, all that said is you don't need that 50 in the middle. You don't need that zoom range in the middle, 35 to 70, um, because there are creative ways of getting around it. I would go after what you guys need, which is the 24 for a wide room. And you can get a cheap one. Don't get the 1.4, 1.2 aperture that costs $1,000. Get the, the cheap 2.8 one that costs like 400 bucks or 300 bucks or something like that. And then a uh, 7,200 or something like that. Um, you, you have a lot of options in that range. You can go as expensive as $2,400 for a lens or um, you can get like an F4 f-stop that's a whole lot cheaper a whole lot cheaper mm -hmm. and it basically does the same thing it's just not going to blur the background as much that's all mm -hmm. so. i know i'm a big lover of like really great depth of field and i think that's one thing i've been trying to get him to do more of um mm -hmm. but again it's hard unless you're in the optimal settings with only really having the 24 to 105 to work with you know yeah um but i mean it does get really nice depth of field but i would like to see like him evolve into doing more of that like you said in this image that you just pointed out so well even in this image right now i would guess that you're probably around like a 60 millimeter or something like you're really close to that and you're not exactly 100 right mm -hmm. is that right uh, scott um yeah i don't even know what that means <laughs> uh that, that just means like uh you're zoomed in all the way with 100 uh, yes i would say probably that's true because there was actually puddles all over the place there. It was a bog. Um, and there were only a few places that I could stand. So I was probably zoomed in. Okay. Yeah. Um, you guys want me to show you what I did on the editing part of yeah. this? Okay. Yeah. So I, I did this in Lightroom. And uh, this is fun. I, I don't show a whole lot of people this. Of course, evidently I'm showing the world today. So. <laughs> You're about to. Okay. So this is what I did. Okay. Let me take everything back here. It's normal here. So kind of my basic edits. So this is okay. Let me see if what I do that was different here. Sorry guys, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. So what I do on images is the first thing I change is the exposure. I just uh, expose it up a little bit more. I take my highlights all the way down. Mm -hmm. And I take my shadows almost all the way up. Okay, so you get this really funky HDR looking image. And the way you balance that out is you bring your black levels down on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you'll see what that does just with those settings right there is it makes it more colorful. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I do for most images. You were talking about bringing the whites out. Um, that's yeah, I it. I typically go do the same with shadows and highlights, but then I run into, like you see in the upper left-hand corner where the tree is, mm -hmm. and you get that kind of like, I don't know, blurring of colors. That's the problem that I run into. Gotcha. Um, and I don't really know if people notice that or what, um, but I also feel like sometimes, like if you were to do that and then print this image, would it make it a little bit grainy? No, it's not going to make it a little grainy. Um, the main thing that you want to do when you're shooting these shots and you know you're going to be editing like the way I do is you want to underexpose it just a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, if you're worried about this kind of stuff up here, uh, one of my secret things, I do you guys ever use gradient filters? No. Gradient filters are your best friend. In fact, I have a lot of gradient filters on this and I need to reset it. So let me show you what a gradient filter does. Um, one thing it does is it can eliminate stuff like that that you're worried about. So see how that pulls down um, this little thing here? And all it does is it affects that area that I just um, decided to uh, put that gradient filter on. So if you're worried about the brightness, you can just take it up like this, okay? And just eliminate that so that's not a focal point. Exactly. But the cool thing about gradient filters is that you can put a huge amount of focus on you. And mm -hmm. I'm going to send this video to you guys later. So if you uh, forget how I did this, you'll see it. But you take this. This is what I like to do. I like to kind of just bring it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then do the same thing on this side. 
maybe do it on the bottom and you'll see I quickly had like four or five of these things. Um, and now let me show you the difference. Wow. So actually, let me show you the difference with just the gradient filters here. Uh, right here. So see how light it is? And now I put all the focus on you. Um, and what's cool is when you do this and you go to your next image, you just scroll down here to this previous button and hit previous on the next image and it'll do all the exact same settings. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you wanted to do it to this one, you just, it, it would apply the same settings and then you adjust from there, assuming that the image is very similar. Mm -hmm. And that gets you through editing that, really fast. That's clutch because we deal a lot with that flat lighting that just looks really, really boring unless you do some substantial post-processing. Well, and the reason it looks boring is because you're probably starting with a raw image. Do you shoot raw? We stopped shooting raw because we were having uh, storage capacity problems being mm. on the road so much. Yeah. So now we're just doing large format. And okay. I don't know, we don't really print a lot of our images. So we're... Yeah. Well, I'll, I mean, the flat light situation too is just because we're the timing for a trip is set in stone and it's not like we're able to plan a shoot based on the weather. So we have to deal with the situation on the ground when it happens. And when we were in uh, Texas, it was really uh, cloudy and hazy almost the whole time. Um, we're just in California. It was sleeting on us, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> like no cloud structure at all except for one day. And so that happens more often than not where the sky in particular is is the struggle to get around mm -hmm. and and you know the we're, we have the location we're, we're in the great spot but the weather just you know similar you to you shooting a wedding it's like you can't really go back and do that again whereas if you're doing more of a commercial shoot you might have a little bit uh well if it doesn't work out you can kind of reschedule it for another day but like our timing is so set in stone because we work with tourism projects and they want to get as much out of us as they can and however many days we're there so we can't just be like oh we'll come back and shoot this tomorrow so and but, sometimes i only have 10 minutes yeah yeah you know so i've got 10 minutes at a stop and it's like okay evaluate get people out of the picture that are with us or that are just around the area mm -hmm. um, yeah it's it's so, fun it's exciting i think to do that um but you yeah. know so. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing I'm going to be talking about on this podcast thing I'm doing that um, is how to, like, one of the problems I come across at weddings is when I shoot uh, the girls getting their makeup on because there's junk everywhere. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just a really messy room. And a lot of photographers will tell you, well, straighten up the room. Well, I don't like to do that. I don't like to take the time to do that because I don't have the time. So when you're mm -hmm. shooting um, touristy places and you're trying to get rid of people in the scene, what I do is I put my lens behind stuff. So in other words, um, you know, you have this picture behind me, you want to get rid of it. So you'll put like something in front of it and now you're eliminating the picture. But what it does in camera is it blurs it. So like if you put a water bottle, bottle or something like this in front, you know, um, this water bottle will be blurry but you have Kristen like doing something cool over here and all of the focus is on her now. Mm -hmm. um, all, all, I, all I'm saying is block out people with stuff. And that takes a lot of training. Like you literally have to think of that every single time you shoot or you'll just forget it. Um, Cause if you don't practice it, you just forget it. Um, but that, that's just one way to do that. Try. Yeah, it's, I've never. I, 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 I remember, like, and you were, you told me it was pretty basic, but you shot across mm -hmm. your um, your cell phone for it's Carrie and Josh's thing. Yeah. And you're like, that's so basic. And I was like, that was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, but it almost looked like a crystal that you had put in there. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Well, and the key to that kind of stuff is a very low aperture. Mm -hmm. So, all that stuff I said before about getting the cheap lens, um, you're gonna lose the ability to do little effects like that if you don't have your 1.4 or you don't have your 2.8 or something like that. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't, I can't see us really ever buying another lens that was any higher than a 2.8, just because we do like that depth of field. And we do have the 50 at the 1.4, not at the 1.2, but right in the middle there. And it's a huge difference than when I used to have the 1.8, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I think that we would probably go somewhere in the middle range for if we got another lens, not probably not all the way to 1.2, but you know. Well, and Canon is the only one that does 1.2. I, I don't see the, the need for 1.2. But that 51.4 will do everything that I just told you about with the um, reflections and stuff. Now, mm -hmm. an idea for you, since you guys go to, uh, like, a, let's say you're at the beach and you want to crowd out people, you can stand on a chair and use the umbrella to block people and then show Kristen. Like, there are ways around it. You just have to constantly be thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. but I will say when you're in these bad weather environments and it's not going the way you want it, me personally, that's the way I like it because, um, bad weather makes great pictures that people never see because everybody shoots in the sun. Um, but what I would recommend is you can try to do these kind of edits in JPEG, but you're going to do a lot more with raw, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, and did you know? you probably know this already um, that you can set Lightroom to automatically know when you bring in pictures and it'll automatically do a preset for you. Did you know that? Mm -mm. Okay. I did that one time. <laughs> so let's say uh, here, let me get my share screen back on. I'm going to show you this because this is money. All right. And I didn't know that about this for the longest time, but um, let's say, you edit every single image exactly like this. You go up to, let me see if I can find it. Settings to, nope, develop. Okay. So you go to set default settings right here. And you say, uh, change the default settings used by Lightroom and Camera Raw for uh, negative files with the following properties, JPEG. Um, but what it'll do is it'll show Canon, um, 60 here or Nikon D750 and then you say update to current settings and now every single time you import pictures with that camera it'll automatically put these settings in here hmm. and it saves you tons of time um because the worst the worst thing about raw is raw looks crappy when you import it into Lightroom until you put all your uh, developing settings on it. Once you put your developing settings, it looks good. The biggest obstacle that you have to overcome is you know what it originally looks like. And that mm -hmm. sucks. Like literally what I do is sometimes I change an image so much that I've, I think I've overdone it. So I'll stop, I'll go do something else, I'll come back, look at the image, I'll be like, oh, that looks nice. But I know what it originally looks like, and I know how many edits I put on it that I think to myself, oh, that doesn't, that's not going to work. But it does. And that feature that I just showed you, if you have just basic camera settings, like highlights, uh, white level, black level, and shadows, just those set to your camera every single time you import it, you'll automatically see the change. And you start from a whole new level. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you, um, can you, like if it was too much, say, let's say you did those settings and you had an image that it didn't work, can you back them out individually? Uh, when yeah. you do the it's not just a bulk filter yeah. led to it? Okay. Um, okay, you're talking about when the preset is set? So if I made five changes and then save that as the default for the import to the images, mm -hmm. and then I had an image that I only wanted two of the settings. Okay. You know? Yeah. So I could, I could come at it backwards um, with those settings. That's what I was asking if it works that way. If it, if it does it as a, I mean, I guess I could just manually change it back. Right. That's um, what you'll have to do. Okay. And yeah. that would be this line in the middle. Um, yes. Yeah, back to the line in the middle, yeah. So you saw how I was resetting Kristen's photo. Uh, I put everything back to the middle. Uh, what I forgot about was I had all those gradient filters on it too, and that's why it didn't look original. 
So yes, mm -hmm. that's what you would do. Mm -hmm. You just have to remember. Is there? Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, is there a, an in between um, or a a balance you recommend striking when you're doing an image like that so it doesn't look too HDR and like too you know overdone? Because I like the way that you did it, but I see a lot of travel bloggers out there who just every single photo is so HDR. Yeah, you just have to use your own kind of common sense for it. Like I hate stuff looking HDR myself. And mm -hmm. um, I, I go out of my way to find ways to make it not look HDR. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm gonna show you one more feature. I don't wanna show you too much here because I don't wanna overwhelm you, but um, so Scott, so who does most of the editing, Kristen or Scott? I do pretty much all the editing. Okay, so Kristen. Um, let's get out of these gradient filters here. Okay, so you have this image, but maybe it looks too light for you mm -hmm. um, or too HDR. You can go to your tone curve mm -hmm. right here. And in your tone curve, um, you have this section down here is what I use a lot. And you can bring down your shadows more. See how it's mm -hmm. just like making those levels dark. Um, and you can, you can make it a little more dark, but you can do fine tuning adjustments down here. Um, mm -hmm. And these are also things that get saved in your preset also when you're um, uh, saving that stuff I just told you about a second ago. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the image is pretty much the same. I've just made it pop a little bit more. And that's what this tone curve area will do for you. Like, don't mess with this junk because this stuff is complicated up here. I don't, I don't even understand that. But this down here makes sense. And the cool thing about it is that you can save a whole bunch of presets here. Um, so, like, when I go to print, this is what I do. I have this saved, and I print it. It makes it look a lot darker, so my blacks are a lot darker in my prints. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyways, you should mess with this just one day when you have some time and okay. just take it out. Okay. Um, so let's go to this image. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is how it originally was. Mm -hmm. And you asked how you would take this image to the next level. Uh, personally, I think the image is really cool. <laughs> I love that you're in the center here. And I love that the sun is right behind you. I like the clouds. Um, the only thing I, I did not like is the fact that I couldn't see your shadow a little bit more. So all mm -hmm. I did was I just added a gradient filter to it. And you can see mm -hmm. the gradient filters by these little uh, dots right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went from here to here. That's all I did. Um, because like, that's cool. Yeah. But like seeing a reflection, that's cool. Right. And when I did that, it changed the color of it. So I had to kind of like adjust the color of my filter itself and it just adjust that part. Yeah, I also had a trouble, had trouble in post processing this image um, with the color because the color was so brilliant in person and I couldn't quite get that brilliance um, on the camera Anytime I was trying to kind of adjust the temperature, it just made it like look too fake yellow. So how would you go about, would you just use that gradient filter? Would you do something else to kind of make it more true to what we were actually seeing? Yeah, so uh, I like to do the same thing where I like to make the image look like what I remember seeing. Mm -hmm. And a very easy thing to do is with a gradient filter, you just kind of do the top part here mm -hmm. and what I do is instead of messing with this stuff up here, the tint and everything, I go down here and I just add like a little red to it. Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit, not much. And um, like I, I try to bring out colors that way. So mm -hmm. if you remember the sky being blue, you know, just come mm -hmm. over here and just add, you know, a little blue to it. Um, and you'll be amazed what you can do to an image. Uh, mm -hmm. Like here, I say, this part over here where you didn't like all this stuff, you can make this look bright and yellow. Mm -hmm. okay. And just uh, bring that warmth oops, mm -hmm. through the whole entire image. And then bring my exposure down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes it a little more orange, but you want the grass down here to be a little more green. 
So just add a little bit of green, not much, um, but it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And just little adjustments like that just make the co color. And you can oh, see, yeah. look, look how different that image is now. <laughs> We've been slowly changing it little by little. Um, but that looked fine until you go back here and you see the original. And this is what I'm talking about. Is like, once you know it came from here, this looks like too much. Mm -hmm. But right. once you go to other images and come back, it looks absolutely fine. And you mm -hmm. forget your edits. Right. Yeah, so you would use gradient filters for everything in terms of like, so back when I first started photography, I used Photoshop like 15, 20 years ago. And I was using a lot of like dodging and burning to bring out, you know, the brightness. But I've never really figured that out in Lightroom. So it was basically gradient filters taking the place of that if you just want to brighten like spot correct throughout. Yeah, uh, for the most part, you know, if... If you're looking for specific, like a bush to be brighter, you still have to use your dodging and burning tool. But if you're looking for like the whole entire sky or the whole entire ground, gradient filters are just amazing. Okay. Um, what if you had something like a bush that you were trying to remove? I mean, like I can use the clone tool, like the stamp tool to, if I just have like a random bird in the sky that looks like a dust spot to remove that. But what if there's something else that like I needed to remove from the image that was a little more complicated? Um, what tool do you go about? I use using? Photoshop. So um, you, you were saying that you have to do a lot of batch processing uh, with mm -hmm. your images and stuff. Um, I use uh, go to code and hustle. <laughs> okay. I, I guess I could just like type that out or something. Go to codeandhustle.com and I use batch plus. And okay. Batch Plus does everything in Photoshop. So here's how I do it. I do everything in Lightroom, export it, okay? And I export it as a really large file. And then I touch up everything in Photoshop, even a wedding with seven or 800 images, which sounds daunting, but if you have a batch processor, it's super easy. So what's cool is you can have this batch processor. I have mine set up to where I bring in the image, it pops up. I pause it for a second. If I like the image, I just hit a key and then it saves it as a full res, saves it as a high res and saves it as a low res. Mm -hmm. And you could even have it save as a low res with your watermark too and have four different folders that it goes to automatically and everything, that image is good to go. You never have to do another thing to it. Um, and it's so cool because you can pause every single image and you can actually take out stuff, you know, take out that bush or take out that spot. Um, Cause my, my lenses get dirty. And when, when you start shooting at a higher F stop and you're on the beach or something, you start seeing all those spots. Um, Lightroom is kind of slow at taking that stuff out and it's not the greatest, but Photoshop does it great. Um, here, I'll show you a quick example. So, oh wait, I always got to remember to share my screen. Okay. So here you go. Okay, so let's go to Photoshop. And um, so what it does is it puts it in your script section and here's batch plus. So I click it and have, you can, um, you can tell it to add your actions that you have. If you have any actions, you can tell it to uh, change the height and width of it and resize it. Um, you can have it revert back to, you can play with it. Um, but one of the coolest features is you were talking about saving stuff for web. Um, I find saving your images at like a five or a six uh, quality is really, really good. And then you can uh, change folders and stuff. But let me show you real quick. So I call this after Lightroom with a signature. I load it. And then I'm gonna save, okay, so I did an Easter egg hunt the other day, okay? So I say I want to, uh, sorry guys, here's my JPEGs that I had, okay? I'm gonna select all of them, 61 images, and I'm gonna say open. So now the batch starts. So one image comes up, I like it, I'm going to the next. And I'm just pushing a keystroke. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of stuff going on on my computer, so it's going kind of slow. But I'm lit literally 
this is making all my folders and everything else that I need. Mm-hmm. And it's that simple. Um, let me get out of this thing now. Let's see, Let's see it. if I can. There you go. Stop. Um, so now I have my folder here. Brackettville, Easter egg hunt. So now I have this one was just uh, 1,200 pixels and full res. So I have my, let's do this image here. This is the big image right here. And this is the same image uh, saved with my little signature down here. And it's 241 kilobytes uh, big. And it's just easy to do that with everything. Did that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I don't know. It's a, it's a little overwhelming to go into Photoshop sometimes, but that program 79 bucks. And -hmm. before I started using it, I was like, how in the world do photographers use Photoshop for every image? Like that's ridiculous with a wedding. Um, and that just sped everything up and you don't have to have pauses. Like you can literally like have it, make it a 600 by 600 pixel image ready for you all the people who use it for their blogs or for Pinterest or whatever. And uh, it'll automatically do all that stuff for you. Okay. Okay. It, it's going to take you a day of just going through it, mm-hmm. but it's well worth it. And it'll save you so much time in the future. Yeah. Okay. Well, especially cause Kristen's basically developed the flow already. Mm-hmm. And if she can take that flow and unpack what pieces we can automate, yeah. that would be huge. Um, well, that- that thing is so powerful, guys. It's so yeah. powerful. It's awesome. Yeah, okay. and when you're using it, if you have any questions in the future about like how to get your watermark like down to the bottom right hand corner or wherever, like I know how to do that stuff. It took me okay. a little bit to figure that out, but yeah. yeah. All right. Um okay, so let me share my screen. And let me know if you guys uh, need to go or anything. I I'm I just no, we're gonna spend some time with you so i love this image um you were asking how to make this picture better well you got an amazing subject (laughs) amazing background (laughs) um the the only thing that i would say honestly to make this image better is to have a different color dress to make her stand out more um or if if you like that dress and you want all those colors move her away from the wall and have more distance between her and um, the wall. Mm-hmm. So th- do you understand that like, uh, the more distance that is between her and the wall, the more out of focus the background will be? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's what I would do. Like, in most of my photo shoots, like I had Kristen up against a couple walls, but those walls had um, character to them that I wanted in focus, like vines going over her head, or it was like, cool and old but if Mm -hmm. like you don't want people up against walls all the time a lot of times i take people like five or ten feet away from the wall and get a long lens and shoot from further away and Mm -hmm. still frame her in that wall yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and we need a longer lens clearly well that hundred will do it definitely yeah well yeah Sometimes there's cars or there's a street or, you know, mm-hmm. it's a busy area, especially walls. Walls, are, you know, we're stoked if there's not a car parked in front mm-hmm. of you. Know, or sometimes I'm shooting between cars yeah. to get it. And, or I got to get close and do the wide because that's the only way I can not have the car and not cut her feet off, you know, in the image because she always gets mad and I chop her feet off. All the, the time. <laughs> <laughs> Or the horizon lines off, so then when I level it, like my feet are chopped off, and I'm like, you've got to add that space to the bottom of the frame if you're not going to have a level horizon line. So. Yeah. Um, so Scott, do you understand like um, you, you understand like recomposing and stuff like that, right? Um, well, I explain maybe I do. I don't. Oh yeah, I'll show you. Um, so I'll show you with the screen here. So basically. Um, a lot of photographers, even pro photographers, will shoot an image just like this. See how my head is in the middle? Uh, my head is in the middle because that's where your focus point is. So a lot of people focus and take the picture. Um, but you see me when I take pictures. I'll, uh, I don't have my camera with me, but I'll, I'll have the camera and I'll tilt down. 
people are like, why are you, t- are you taking pictures of my feet? No, what I'm doing is getting my focus right here and then I'm taking my headroom and just kind of closing it. Because mm-hmm. you'll see a lot of space up here, uh, way above the head. Whereas um, if you recompose it, you can recompose it down and then you can say, oh, you know what? Let's shift it over here a little bit and get this treadmill in the background or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, recomposing allows you to get other elements into your picture that you would not normally um, because what Kristen has to do is if you take a picture straight on my head is like this what she's going to do is she's going to crop it but she can't tilt down so she has to zoom in so when she crops it like this her image is smaller and she loses like like my logo or anything else that she wanted in the picture originally where uh, just a little recomposition just goes like this and you can get your logo in there and all that stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, and recomposing is the number one thing that separates great from photographers from good photographers because, um, man, I see people who shoot weddings and make a lot of money and all their heads are straight in the middle of every single shot and they don't recompose. But the people who recompose, they get the feet in there you get the head in there, the arms and everything else. Because me personally, this is an awkward image. Well, it's not too awkward because it's bounced by the picture. Okay, so let's do this. So this is awkward because my shoulder is kind of cut off maybe. And you know, sometimes, you know, you want to see all the shoulders. So if it's like kind of like this and you're barely cutting it off, it, it usually gets a little awkward. Mm-hmm. So I always tell people have breathing room around everything so like you know if i'm gonna stand like this i have breathing room around my head around my arms and everything can you still hear me yeah okay cool and i have breathing room around everything Mm -hmm. um that also applies to your background because you can have this image but now you have no breathing room for the picture behind you so little recomposition gets that picture some breathing room Mm -hmm. good tips Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you guys are annoyed by cars, just use the cars. Because guess yeah. what cars have? They have a window on them, and you can do those cool little reflections. Uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah? That's yeah. true. Yeah, I never thought of that. Because <laughs> most of them are junky cars, too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. all like, just a, not a pretty car. But yeah, that's true. I could use the collar or the hood or the windshield or the chrome on the front. Yeah. yeah. And that's just training your brain. Right. You know, for the longest time, I wanted to do double exposures at weddings. I knew how to do them. I was good at it, um, but I didn't practice it. So when I got to weddings, I forgot it. So it, once I started practicing it more, I did it a lot more. So mm-hmm. it's just keeping it top of mind. Uh, you want me to go through these other images here? Yeah, and a yeah. couple other post-processing while you're at it that questions I had was um, – you know, for example, if there was like a slight blur to the image, but it wasn't too bad, other than like sharpening, using the sharpening tool, what else can I do to make that crisp enough to use on the web and it not look like I just took a crappy photo? Yeah, uh, there's not a whole lot that you can do. You just have, I mean, I would just do sharpening myself. Um, Again, sharpening in Photoshop is better than sharpening in Lightroom. Okay. Even though they're basically the same thing. Just Lightroom just uh, attacks it differently. Okay. Okay, I didn't know if there was another tool um, to use. And then also for grainy images, other than the noise reduction, is there another way to kind of smooth out the background? Like if you have a night shot that was shot at a pretty high ISO and you, you know, put it into your computer and you didn't notice the noise when you took it, but suddenly you see it is there a good uh, function for, you know, making that as like unnoticeable as possible? Honestly, I just use the details Mm -hmm. um, button. I'll show you here. Oh gosh, let me show my screen again. I just forget to do that. All right. So um, like uh, this shot right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just do it very simple. I just, I, I honestly just put like 21 noise reduction on it and that's it. I, I don't That's do the only anything. tool I use too, but I didn't know if there was something else. Cause sometimes then it makes the entire image kind of have this like glow to it. 
that I don't want when I really am just trying to get like the grain out of the sky. Yeah, it's it's basically um, shooting everything in the proper settings to begin with. Um, you always want to be at the lowest ISO you could possibly be at. Right. Um, and you forget. So our is pretty high at night. Yeah. Our, okay. our gear is like, I think it's like 10,000, like an interior shot in the evening. 10,000 and up is probably where we would even bother taking the shot, you know? That's because you're that hand holding it, right? Yeah, because yeah. we don't travel with the tripod, which is another issue. Obviously, exactly. we could go a lot lower if we're doing tripod. Yeah, I would look at gorilla pods. It's a, we have a okay. We have a yeah. item with the DSLR. We use them. We have one mounted on our ceiling for a GoPro for our time lapses. But um, yeah, Casey Neistat. Uh, you know who that is? Yeah. He, he mm -hmm. uses the gorilla pod with the DSL. I mean, they make them really strong, and I think it's like 130 bucks or something. Okay. But uh, those things are super lightweight and you can put them anywhere. And that's the first thing I thought of when you said shooting uh, rooms is mm -hmm. get a gorilla pod, put your DSLR on it and you can put it pretty much anywhere mm -hmm. and lower that ISO um, <laughs> as much as possible. Cause yeah, that'll kill you. Um, I'd say like at night I usually shoot around like 8,000 which isn't as bad now that, I mean, the better quality the cameras become. Obviously, like a couple models ago, I would have never been able to shoot 8,000. Right. Uh, I think ours goes up to like 25.6 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to stay under 8,000. Obviously, a lot lower than that would be ideal. But again, we haven't been traveling with a tripod for several years now. So uh, let me give you a tip with high ISO. So if you're, um, if you guys are shooting each other at night, like at a restaurant or something, and you have to use high ISO, uh, the opposite is true of what you would normally think, which is shooting at a higher ISO with a faster shutter speed is better than shooting at a lower ISO with a lower shutter speed. Um, it's okay. weird. It's counterintuitive, okay. but the way the cameras work, um, like, I would much rather shoot a wedding ceremony that's dark at 25,600 ISO at 200th of a second than I would at 10,000 ISO at 60th of a second because that faster shutter speed really makes it a little more sharper and it's easier to clean up. Right. And then you don't have the potential of camera shake because you're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a holdover from when they had film speeds that was developed for certain, right? I mean, because it's a software based, it has nothing to do with mechanical in the camera itself. Right. You yeah, it, it's all about the sensitivity of your film or sensor. Yeah. So the camera is basically trying to replicate what film used to do. Exactly. Whatever chemicals that they used um, to get faster uh, film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and also just to kind of reassure you on print stuff, like, um, when, when you see that your photos are pixelated or grainy in your computer, um, they don't print like that. That usually comes out more like a, like a film grain look, um, uh, which is kind mm -hmm. of reassuring that used to scare the crap out of me. Like <laughs> again, my pictures would be pixelated, but it just looks grainy is all it does when you print okay. it. Yeah. Cause I'd been worried about that. We were going to print some waterfall photos mm -hmm. and I didn't use sharpening at all, but I did uh, bring the shadows all the way out and then the, um, the highlights as well. And I was worried that if once we ordered that print, it looked great on the screen, but I wasn't sure how that would translate if we were to print it in 11 by 14, for example. Yeah, no, it, it would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, and those waterfall pictures are kind of hard because I'm sure you're finding out you need neutral density filters to get like mm -hmm. flowing water. Mm -hmm. you guys know about that stuff yeah, we have we have one and again that just comes down to if we have our tripod on us or not because yeah. you don't really have a level surface anywhere in a waterfall that you can you know set your camera down to do a longer exposure so yeah i have an nd10 that you can't even see through you know yeah you have to focus first and then put yeah. it in. <laughs> turn the autofocus off because it'll focus on the back of the, the sunglasses that i just put on the lenses and mm -hmm. uh but that's a really fun lens. I love it. 
That's cool. You, know, actually, you can also erase people from a shot if they're moving. Mm-hmm. Like we did some at, at uh, Universal Orlando, and it's just like Kristen standing in the middle, and then there's a slight blur of people, so mm-hmm. you get motion, um, you know, built into the image, but also you don't have that that person standing there, you know, smoking a cigarette with their kid or whatever, right. whatever else is going on on the side. So yeah, I like that one. I want to use it more, but the changing the lens, but I think I need, do they make a quick disconnect for the round ones? Yes. Uh, lead filters. Um, that's what I use. Um, it has a, a system that kind of like, uh, just attaches and you have filters that you slide into it. Mm. it's awesome right you know you showed me that before but like for this lens for this filter i already have that has a thread in Mm -hmm. am i just threading it in they don't have a system that would no not not that i know of uh they might but i don't know of any i think it was it it was a filter but yeah okay yeah then i'm jiggling the camera i'm like oh do i have it framed right i can't tell you know i'm just gonna go for it yeah, I mean, if I were you guys, uh, with the popularity of your blog, I mean, I would totally call up Lee and say, hey, you know, we're going to be try- trying travel pictures and all this stuff. Uh, we will promote your product. And all they have to do is look at your numbers and go, yeah, here's two kids. <laughs> you know? <laughs> really. Yeah, I'd milk that. Um, oh, Scott, you'll love this uh, as far as history goes. But there's when I first started photography, I learned about a guy who did 4 by 5 photography and he was hired to take pictures of some railroad station in uh, New York, one of the most popular ones ever. And they wanted no people in it. And they were like, well, that's never going to happen. But this photographer, he put so many neutral density filters in front of his four by five camera that he ended up doing like a eight or 10 hour shot wow. of this railroad station. And he got nobody in it because everybody was moving and there's a little faint ghostly image of a guy who read a newspaper for like three hours in mm-hmm. one line. but yeah that's the really cool thing about those filters is that i mean you can eliminate everything i mean yeah. have you ever seen those pictures of like uh big cities with no cars and no people <laughs> it's because they can do like an eight hour long shot with all those filters yeah Pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge just with figuring out how long to do it with the ND10. I couldn't imagine how, what, I don't know how they add it, but like an ND100. Oh, uh, yeah. Know? It's it's ridiculous. They just stack uh, neutral density filters on top of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as this image goes, uh, like, what was your question about this one? Mm, take. I mean, it's pretty epic already, I think. But yeah, it's better not a square. I guess he cropped it a square for his profile shot. But oh yeah, okay. it, when you actually have the full image, you can tell that I get the horizon line could have been a little bit lower to have rule of thirds like on you know vertical and horizontal. But he mm-hmm. was like right at the one third line of the the right side of that image. So yeah, I guess I just threw it in there because I I think it's one of our more recent best shots that we got where we really captured that was that's the moment right there that's what it looked like that's cool golden everything was on fire um it was really peaceful we were the only ones there and i just a silhouette on the the horizon so i just wanted to see i would make him blacker though like i don't know if you touch this or i touch this but i would make i would want him to be darker because you can kind of start to see almost like you know his clothing a little bit yeah so all you do is like uh you can go into these um parts right here uh and just make them darker like that if you want and then if you end up making the sky too bright i'm telling you those gradient filters will change your life and what's cool especially with a sunset shot is you can do anything you want to it so now it's yellowish you know, let's, let's kind of balance that out a little bit and then add your own color to it and, uh, you know, make it more orange. Yeah. Now you got a vibrant, crazy shot. Yeah. That, um, and, and then you can bring that gradient filter in on him to make him a little more uh, bright if you want. And, and it's usually just minor adjustments and all that. Yeah. Um, the only thing that can really make the shot any better is just nature crazy clouds and stuff um that that's really it (laughs) and just positioning where you want 
What's that? How about how about that round flare? Do you like that or no? Yeah, I like it. It doesn't bother me. Um, if you can see the round flare in the camera, I would try to get the whole round flare in there because that little part that's missing, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's just me being a photographer. No one else really cares about that. I don't think you can see it in the camera, right? Um, yeah, I don't think I, I don't see it. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember. I remember it being more like when I uploaded them, I was like, oh, huh, that's there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I like I it. When I looked down and was framing when you went out on it, I looked down at the camera and I saw the circle, but I didn't think to try and tilt it up a little bit, which would yeah. have been cool to get the whole thing. It's, it's kind of hard to avoid flare when you're pointing directly into the sun. Yes. yes. Um, so this was your original image. And this is what I did to it, just to kind of like, um, and all I did was, here, let's reset it. So I, um, you know, did the same things. I brought my highlights down, brought my shadows up. I always add a little bit of white, and then I brought my black levels down. And then um, to add a little bit more shading uh, mm -hmm. to him, I just you could bring those levels up a little bit like that. Um. But again, gradient filters are like king. I mean, to bring the focus. Okay, so let me show you. So this image is it's kind of busy, but it has a focal point right here. Is that Scott? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it has a focal point, and I love how you framed everything in here. That's really cool. Um, but you want to bring the attention to him a little bit more, and that's where the gradient filters will help you out a lot. Um, you just pull it in make it darker because the sun is right there. Let's just add a little bit of color to it. I mean, you know, not much, just a little bit. And then um, bring it in around the edges here because no one's gonna know you do all this stuff to the image um, because when they look at the image, they're seeing it for the first time as it is, um, unless you wanted to show the details, but just those few little adjustments you know, bring a little bit more attention and more color to the image. Mm -hmm. um, I would make sure that he's dead center, like right here okay. in the image. Um, in fact, I wonder if you can, uh, if, I wonder if I can show you just by cropping it a little bit here. I mean, so do you see the difference in that one and how he's dead center versus that one? Th now, th this is just in post that I'm showing you this. You lose all this stuff right here because I'm editing it in post. Mm -hmm. But if you recompose, like I was just telling you guys, um, where Kristen just moves over here a little bit, puts him in the center of the image and still gets that wide shot, well, then you can have all of this and him in the center. And that would make that shot a lot more epic. She wouldn't have got the sun if she'd moved. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, then she needs to have you move. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But the main thing is just like putting you in the center. I mean, look at a lot of Chris Picard photos and stuff. I mean, uh, the people that are in the action doing something, they're usually like very well centered in the image that he okay. has. Uh, this one, I, I mean, I thought it was pretty cool. I just added a little more brightness to it, <laughs> personally. Uh, I think it's neat. The main thing that you have to look for with silhouettes is separation. And you have it here and here. You're getting a little closer here. Um, but separation is the number one thing. Just have everybody, you know, have their space in between their arms and stuff. But, I mean... You can tell you have cowboy hats. You can tell you're shooting. I think you guys did a really cool job on it. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> and so you, what was the question about this one? Low light photography? Yeah. And probably action too. Yeah, it was low light action shots. Okay. So I'm trying to get enough exposure so that I can still see the subject, but also he's twirling a, a lasso. Yeah. Well, the way that you did it is really nice. Um, so all I did was I just changed the edit because he's in sharp focus. Um, 
you have the lasso kind of blurred. It's not really moving. You're not showing motion, but it's blurred and you can, you can tell something. It's like there's a little bit of motion right in here. Uh, I think it looks really good. These pictures are all about composition though. So you have this really bright background over here. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a little more dark. Basically all I would do in editing is just put the focus on him. Oops. Mm -hmm. So let me see how I have this. Okay. And all I did was I used my gradient filters to bring in the darkness over here. Mm -hmm. and bring in the darkness over here and just focus on him a little bit more and I made him more uh, warm yellowish intent versus mm -hmm. the cold look right uh, that's in that that image um, you know and you can see like even the green and the trees and everything is brought out just by using gradient filters um, let me show you so this is without gradient filters and this is with mm -hmm. Now, before I showed you this, could you tell there was a gradient filter here? No. Mm -mm. Well, and it's your image. So yeah. the fact that you couldn't tell is a good thing um, because like I said, over and over you will second guess your edits because um, you know what the original looks like. <laughs> and it's really easy to go too far on an edit. Um, but yeah, I liked it. No, I would just say that uh, the background, uh, it, I mean, there's not a whole lot you could do about it. I mean, yeah. I, I would try to crop out this maybe because that's a little distracting, the fan up there. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's, it's really nice. And I love that you got it at a low angle to do it. Mm -hmm. And I assume you got into a low angle because you wanted the whole lasso in there? Yeah, and just getting down on, I was sitting on, on the floor in the front because there were a bunch of people there. So it was yeah, more it was like, like getting, getting in front of the crowd. yeah, it was basically <laughs> getting in front of the crowd, but not blocking all of them from the show. So well, I love that you're respectful like that because <laughs> I would do the exact same thing. And, but you can see like getting low gives you more dynamic angle. I mean, when I review portfolios, I know instantly if somebody just stood there and took a picture. And like that bugs the heck out of me. Like, I mean, just like bend down a little bit or, or I mean, it's Climb on top of something. And yeah. yeah, well it's, or, and it's just little changes. I mean, it's, it's literally going from here to here. It's a huge difference. I mean, look, look at this uh, frame popping out of my head. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just go down just a little bit when well, now my head just has a frame popping out of the right side of it. <laughs> <laughs> But you can see like just a little bit of a difference makes all the difference. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if you want something dramatic, get low. You know that, right? Get low and everything becomes dramatic. Well, she always gives me grief about getting low because she says it changes the, the way she looks in the dress or whatever. Well, well and, there's a difference between yeah. like shooting up and getting someone seven chins between being <laughs> on the ground and getting more of a wide angle shot of the space. Well, and before you started saying that, Scott, I was going to say, unless you're shooting girls, like you don't want to yeah. like shoot girls from a low angle like that. <laughs> unless, yeah. unless she's going like this and she wants to look like powerful, you know? Yeah. There's a way to do it where you're not, you know, adding more weight than necessary to a human. So, <laughs> so, um, here's a little test for you guys that you can do in your yard there. Kristen is the subject or, or Scott, you can do it either way. And I want you to shoot the same image. Uh, what's the widest lens you have? 16 to 35. Okay. So shoot, um, her at a 35 real close. Okay. And then shoot the exact same image with a hundred and go further back and crop her the same way. And look at those images side by side. Okay, you're gonna see a huge difference in like arm width and everything. Like her arms are gonna be, you know, more narrow in one and bigger in the other and stuff like that. There's little tips like that. It's the lens, not size. Um, the lens length that you use uses makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. That's why the 85 is such a popular portrait lens because it makes people's faces look so beautiful and everything. Whereas if you're really close, I mean, you might even be able to see it. I mean, getting this close, how big and puffy my face is. And then like further back, you know, I mean, it's not as puffy. Mm -hmm. 
So just do that experiment when you get some time uh, off from home decor stuff. <laughs> it's just two shots, but it'll really change your perspective on how to shoot her yeah. uh, in front of murals and stuff. <laughs> And not make me look as big as Well, that's a good idea. I mean, I, I like the, the idea of practicing just with some settings without any pressure to get the shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I can, you know, evaluate it when I have a moment and, and integrate it in versus like, you know, we're, we're on the move and we're doing stuff. And um, so, yeah, no, that's a good idea. I'll try that. Yeah. If there was one piece of advice I'd have you guys get from this whole entire thing is just work on your composition as you're shooting. Mm -hmm. That is the number one thing because that changes everything. Um, and really it's just looking at your backgrounds and trying to make them clean and just kind of moving over left or right to get that light pull out of the way or that you know, guy who's fishing in the background or there's a Coke can right there, just move a couple steps and it's gone. Um, that way you don't have to Photoshop it or anything else. There's so much you can do just by changing your position in, you know, with your camera to your face. Mm -hmm. Beginning, yeah. Yeah, guys. Uh, I went through all your pictures. What are some other questions that you have? I'm looking at your email here. I think, I mean, all the tips you gave us for uh, working in Lightroom are going to be super helpful because I feel like my composition has improved enough that I'm more than anything looking at like what to do after I have the photos now because like I said, so many variables are out of our control like the lighting or the background when you can't move around to get it out of there. So like this gradient filter situation I feel like is going to be life changing. <laughs> It was for me. <laughs> and, um, and what I've struggled with a lot is I'm pretty good at certain iPhone apps for editing. So because I have the wireless on my camera, if I'm just posting to Instagram or social media, I'll send the image to my camera and I'll edit it in Snapseed or uh, Color Story, and I'll be really happy with the result. But I've never been able to get those same results when I'm editing in Lightroom. And I think it's just not knowing some of these functions like gradient filters. So I feel like I'll have more questions for you in a few weeks once I've applied what you've given us today totally. uh, to uh, my workflow. And then like I'll start to realize other things in addition to that that would be helpful in you know, making my images look really stunning. So. Yeah. I'm a... Uh... I'm going to send you guys my first audio podcast once I get it uploaded. And mm -hmm. it's just, it talks about composition and recomposing. And I think I explained it really well. I use a baseball analogy. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to hear what you guys think of it, but it's, you can put it in your ears as you're shooting and you can like try it. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to do some more like that. And I think it'll help you out because basically it just gives an example of like baseball. It's like mm -hmm. if you're taking a picture of a kid throwing a baseball, and you just have the kid in there, well, you could be throwing a baseball to anybody. Like, I mean, who's he throwing a baseball to? You know, the dog, the dad? I mean, is he playing by himself? But if you just reposition yourself over by the first baseman, well, now he's throwing it to the first baseman, and you see them both. And now you have some context to your image. Mm -hmm. It's just like that guy paddling, you know? Is he paddling all by himself out there? Is he with a group of people? Um, what you want to do is, you want to make him look and feel as isolated as possible in that image so that he has this whole entire sunset world to himself. You know, that's mm -hmm. like, that's a very powerful image. But if, if you cropped off two people over on the side, well now, you know, that's a different story, you know? That was a, a good thing. I was the only one out there. <laughs> oh, that was, that was you on the paddleboard. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And there was nobody else for miles. In the Gulf, too, uh, wasn't he? Yeah, you know, it was like an October day, cold. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I didn't even get in the water, but it was, <laughs> it was the water and bat rays swimming around, and yeah, it was really neat. Cool. Well, guys, you yeah. are welcome to email me any time you have questions. You know that. So uh, I'd like to um, to sort of digest all of the things that you said and a um, lot. And then come back and do this again. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, and I'll send you the recording. 
as soon as okay. it's downloaded, I'll put it up on like Google Drive and let you download it, okay? And let us know when you are officially putting all this stuff up so we can, because we have friends who are always looking for, um, cool. you know, photography tutorials and someone to help coach them. So I think this is going to be a game changer for a lot of people who don't have someone near them to, you know, work on like one-on-one -on -one coaching with. That's cool. Yeah, I've actually uh, started doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching now. So yeah, like for a session like this, I would charge like a hundred bucks yeah. uh, for an hour. And um, sure. that's what I'm starting at. And I'm like, I'm just looking to see if I get people to do it. So if you know anybody, yeah. yeah. It's, just on, it's on my website so they can just find it easy. Okay, so. perfect. All right, guys. Well, I miss you guys. I'm, uh, Are you coming back soon? Uh, I don't, uh, I'll be coming back for family sessions eventually, but okay. not right now. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give everybody. I know a family in Tullahoma who, uh, you know, needs a family session. Well, you guys will be first on my list when I come mm -hmm. there. So. Got a little baby to take. I know. Ah, oh, can't believe you're you guys are aunts and uncles already. Yeah. Oh. Like, oh. Beautiful. Looks like the whole family had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looked like the whole family from some of those pictures. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite picture of everybody looking at the baby. You really yeah. captured that well. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll see you later. And uh, just so you know, with Zoom, you can actually record these also. So if you okay. have to do meetings with people, like you can push record also and okay. get it. It's pretty cool what you can do. Okay. And you can talk to 20 people one time. All right. Awesome. <laughs> All right, bye. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs>